And ultimately, the purpose is to inform the debate and to participate in this debate, not just to use it as we used to internally as a device to discuss strategy and decision making, but to bring it into this wider form of energy issues which are debated everywhere and which are so important. What we do want to do with it is to outline long-term trends, to point the finger at what we call the fault lines of this complicated international system, where things could go wrong, where there are decision points where today's decision will affect the future, and where problems are coming up, and where solutions are coming up. So these kind of fault lines holding together this slow-moving international global system. That is really sort of the focus of attention we are striving at. One of them is China and India, in particular the question of uh, how will demand shape up from there. The other one is the Middle East, and the obvious question how do oil and gas supplies shape up from there. And the third one, with a great deal of collaboration with research in the downstream, in r and in our segment, is the future of transport fuels. And then what we do is we take uh, major trends made, which come from our data and we take these three focal areas and we try to be very concentrated and focused in distilling key questions and key answers on these very important sub-segments of the global energy market. There are two sort of mega, mega trends in the background of this. One is this amazing convergence of energy intensity across countries and regions. Now, energy intensity simply means the amount of energy you need to produce one unit of GDP. If you want, it's the broadest based measure of efficiency we know of. Never since about 150 years has the global efficiency of energy in that sense be higher than today. And never have different countries been as similar in their efficiency as they are today. It's easy to see why. It's an effect of globalization. The other trend is much less of a general nature and probably more accidental, but it will also dominate the next 20 years. It is that fuel shares globally equalize. So it used to be a situation always where we had at least one dominant fuel. First it was coal through the Industrial Revolution, then it was oil in the age of oil. By 2030, for the first time since the Industrial Revolution, there will be no more one dominant fuel. Instead, what we will have is fuel shares which are roughly equal between coal, gas and oil, and on a lower level, roughly equal for the non-fossil fuels between nuclear, hydro and renewables. The obvious question for India and China is, will China to continue to grow in its energy demand as fast as it did the last 10 years, and will India become another China? The answer is that Chinese energy demand is bound to slow down, for once, because of one of these mega trends, which I said, the decline in energy intensity, China's industrial sector is very large and will, continue, will come down a little bit. So by 2030, we'll see a China with energy demand still growing, of course, but growing much more modestly. India will not become another China simply because of its industrial structure and its history is different. It can leapfrog much of this industrial development which had to take place in China. It is much more based on services. Uh, and that's where India's future lies, and that means that its energy demands during the necessary process of industrialization, which will take place, will be much more gently developing and more modest than those of China have been. We, like most others, have assumed that oil exports from the Middle East will continue to grow, and so the question is, what makes us think that? For energy production in the Middle East to continue growing and to be exported, there need to be some changes. And what we think is likely to happen is that energy efficiency will finally start to improve also in the Middle East. What we would expect to see is that there is more gas production in the Middle East, which will crowd out oil from domestic energy use, in particular in industry and power generation. And here it's the price differential between gas and oil which is helpful because many of these countries still use oil to generate electricity or for industrial uses where it could easily be replaced with gas. That is our sort of perspective on the Middle East that because of energy improvements, oil will be available also to increase exports. In our view, transport will still be based on oil products. 87% of global transport will be based on oil. The rest will be biofuels and to a much, about 7% and to a much smaller ex, uh, extent things like uh, natural gas and electricity. Now why is this? Because we think that the most efficient way of developing uh, the global transport fleet will be hybridization. 
So it will not be a situation where all of a sudden a fully electric battery driven car comes along and all the power comes from the grid. What this means is that uh, driving and transport will still be petroleum based but also that in terms of oil consumption the efficiency will double. If you make a simple comparison and you would imagine the number of vehicles we think will be there in 2030, at current technologies you will need 11 million barrels per day more to make them keep them on the road. 11 million barrels is roughly about the size of Saudi Arabia. In my book, sustainability refers to two issues. One is to make energy available and sustain, and this on a sustainable basis, so that everybody can drive, has electricity, has light, can heat his apartment. So that's sustainability and the availability of the energy to make all that possible. And the other use of it is the sustainability in a broader sense, and that refers mostly to climate change. With respect to the first one, making energy available for more and more people, I think we do very well. If you look at the second sense of sustainability, doing all of this without damaging the environment, it doesn't look very good. One of the most important things, to my mind, which fall out of this exercise, of all these calculations and all this brain power in many places which went into this, is that there is an obvious link between these two things. We know that we are good at making energy available more and more efficiently. Why don't we look what the driving forces are for this and apply them to the, car to the carbon problem? What does that mean? Concretely, that means that we harness forces such as competition and technology and the price mechanism, market forces. So we need to support everything which brings competition in there, which makes uh, non-carbon energy meet the market test, and everything which puts a price on the source which we want to minimize, which is carbon.